Hi, so I've done this bit before actually in a different video and it's kind of a, a proof of concept and sort of where we're heading with it. And what we have here is um, 5 grams of copper sulphate and 75 milliliters of hot water and here we've got 7.5 grams of ascorbic acid in 75 milliliters of water. Now the ascorbic acid will actually reduce the copper sulphate back down to elemental copper and it acts like a capping agent and a scavenging agent for um, any free radicals that might want to re-oxidise that copper back into copper oxide. And all you really do is make sure that they just come from boiling, stir it and add one to the other. And you'll see almost immediately it goes this greenish brown colour. But as you add it and continue stirring, then you'll get a coppery coloured solution that has a hint of green behind it. Now I'm not too worried about uh, nanoparticle size distribution here, so I haven't done much to uh, affect that. But if you look at that, you can see that that's gone green. And what you can see precipitating out to the bottom are salmon pink particles. Now those salmon pink particles are actually copper. And if you do enough of this, what you end up with is that. Now you can see the layer of salmon pink copper particles at the bottom, and then this on the top, because it's been washed several times, is uh, ascorbic acid. It's ascorbic acid solution protecting those copper nanoparticles and keeping them as copper. Now, we're going to leave that to settle out before we do the next bit. Okay, so after leaving that to settle for a little bit, you can see that we've got quite a green solution here, and then our layer of pink particles at the bottom there. Now you know that's copper, because copper is salmon pink, and copper oxide is brick red. Now we pour that top solution off. and put it to one side for a moment. You can see the copper in the bottom of the beaker there. And we can turn that copper into an ink in the same way that you turn any of these materials into an ink or paint. I'm not too worried about it at the moment, so I'll just paint a little bit of it on there. Now because I'm doing this in um, air, it will oxidise. And it begins to oxidise almost immediately. The only thing that was stopping it oxidising was the ascorbic acid which is now actually in that beaker there. So, paint my copper on there and just leave it to dry. Okay, once it's dry, you get this sort of pinkish looking coating there, which is your copper nanoparticles. And if you want to test that for conductivity, put it about a centimetre apart. There you go. About 7 ohms or so resistance on it. Now, that will get worse over time because they're nanoparticles, so they're going to oxidise relatively quickly. But you've also removed the ascorbic acid capping agent from them, so you've got very little in the way of protection. If you want to see if it's actually copper, then just take something like a spoon and burnish the nanoparticles quite hard, and you'll see it comes up as a nice copper sheen of copper metal because you've mechanically blended those particles together and again that is going to oxidize. Now, what that means if you want to use this method to make a um, copper nanoparticle ink you've got to make it fresh every time and use it pretty quickly and then put some kind of coat on top of that in order to make it um, usable because it's going to go off but if it does go off it's going to form a uh, red copper oxide at the first step and if it does form red copper oxide, then you can use uh, photonic sintering to actually get it back. So the photonic sintering is um, one of those methods that actually is quite new, and it's using xenon light at high power flashed across a copper oxide, a red copper oxide ink, to reduce the copper oxide ink back into copper, copper traces. Now, We've already got copper, our problem is that if we leave that for about a week or so, what we'll end up with is a copper oxide ink. Now, 
that's not actually as desperate as it you can uh, make yourself a photonic uh, flash sintering unit actually quite simply just go buy a disposable camera and flash it over the lines that, that will photonically sinter them a uh, photonic sintering doesn't only uh, change the copper oxide back to copper it melts the copper slightly and makes it run into each other and prevents further oxidation if you want a more powerful unit buy a second hand flash, uh, one of those larger ones that uh, photographers use that run off about 6 volts, 18 volts, whatever it is uh, wire up the hot shoe and use that, just put a, a press button on it and you'll be able to flash it with a much higher power light so making a photonic sintering unit sounds like a big deal actually it's really really easy, like I said, just buy yourself a disposable camera it's going to work now obviously when we've remo removed the larger size copper particles because they sank to the bottom, what we're left with is this green solution. Now the only things that went in there were ascorbic acid and copper sulphate. So we know that there's some uh, copper left in there. And it's a question now, how to get that copper out? Now I was reading um, about various methods of doing that and of course the simplest method is by a replacement, a replacement reaction. Basically, if I chuck some iron in there and give it a stir, then the iron will replace the copper. So the copper will come out and the iron will go into solution, forming iron sulphate. And the copper will drop to the bottom there. Now the reaction happens by the, uh, the replacement on the surface of the iron. So once that iron is actually uh, totally coated with copper, this reaction will cease and what we'll end up with is copper coated iron particles at the bottom so there'll be kind of a, a muddy reddish brown colour and um, iron sulphate in solution depending on how much iron we actually chuck in there now that is obviously not very um, wonderful as a solution because you can see that it's agglomerating at the bottom there in my dirty reddish brown the size of the copper particles we're getting out is dictated by the size of the iron particles. But as a theory, then it's kind of interesting to, to sort of play with that a little bit. And, and that's where I started thinking about it. So this is what occurred to me. And it occurred to me from the graphene making experiments that we're doing, we use this blender to actually make graphene. And one of the theories about how it's actually working is that the high rotational speed creates cavitation, and that cavitation is blowing lumps off the graphite to form graphene. And I was thinking, well, if that's the case, then it should work for the formation of copper nanoparticles, particularly when we're dropping the iron in, because of course the copper is being formed on the surface of the iron, we have two different materials. If we're putting that in a cavitation um, environment, then that copper should be blown off the surface of the iron, leaving fresh iron exposed to form another lump of copper. And that should continue to happen, and we should get a uh, fine colloidal dispersion of copper nanoparticles in here. Now, obviously, using the ascorbic acid, acid method, we're going to have a precipitation of um, larger copper particles too. So what I'm kind of expecting out of this is that we get a layer of pink copper particles and then a colloidal copper suspension, which will be kind of a coppery brown colour. Now, remember, when we did this previously, what we actually got was a bright green solution. So if we're getting a different colour solution out of it, it's because we've got different sized particles in there so I'm going to turn this on and add the ascorbic acid and of course it gets very noisy when I do that but in here what we've got is 200 milliliters of water and 20 grams of copper sulfate then in here we've got 100 milliliters of water and 30 grams of ascorbic acid to overkill on the ascorbic acid so that we don't get the reduction too heavily and here we go <laughs> Well that's really quite beautiful actually, that green colour is um, completely gone. What we've got is this nice brownish pink. Now as I said, and you can see it there, there's quite a sludge of uh, copper uh, sitting there, the sort of pink nanoparticulate copper. So we give that a wash out. 
And of course, it's um, imparting energy to it, so it's got quite hot as well. You can see it steaming away. Now, the only things that went in here, remember, are ascorbic acid, water, copper sulfate, and iron. And what we know has happened is that the iron has replaced the copper. So we've got iron sulfate, copper, and ascorbic acid in there. Iron sulfate is actually what you buy as the iron supplement for your diet. So if you're short of iron, then you're being given iron sulfate. So not particularly poisonous. It's also used as a fertilizer. Copper sulfate really um, demands a little bit of care because that's root kill. Um, the ascorbic acid obviously is just vitamin C, so you don't really need to worry about it at all. So there is an astonishingly easy method and a green method of uh, making copper nanoparticles. You can see the copper separates me out of the bottom. But what's most interesting is the liquid here, which is a kind of a brown colour instead of the green that we would expect if we still had um, copper and ascorbic acid or um, ferric sulphate, which is green in solution. So I'm just going to leave that to settle out a little. So there we go, there's our solution. It's kind of a, a blackish colour instead of um, a light green or, or strong green colour that you would kind of expect. The light green because of the iron sulphate, strong green because of the copper um, ascorbic acid that we saw before. You can see a background of green to it because um, the iron sulphate is still there. So you'd want to separate that out. Um, now one way of separating it out is using solvent extraction, so you'd use dichloromethane and that will pick out the copper nanoparticles and leave everything else behind. Or you could use isopropanol alcohol and then you would salt out the alcohol and the alcohol would pull the copper out with it. Now this stuff is actually interesting in itself because it contains copper nanoparticles and um, could be used as a heat exchange fluid. There's one thing you could do with it because it's um, very good for that. Now if I paint a layer of this, and obviously it's stupidly thin, it begins as relatively clear, and as that dries, it'll go through stages and it'll get more coppery as it dries, and then it'll get blacker as that copper oxidizes. And you can see it going copperish already as it begins to dry out. Now the other thing that we got from it was this, and this is our larger copper particles, and you can see the ascorbic acid solution here is kind of a light copper colour in itself. So there's also some copper um, distributed through that range there. Now, <coughs> this is only the first steps of uh, this particular experiment. I mean, I think it's been relatively successful. And all I did really was use water. Now, if we um, put different things in there, then we can change the morphology of the copper particles that we form. So, for instance, if we chuck some PVP in there, or some ethylene glycol, the actual shapes of the particles are going to change. Uh, PVP is quite likely to make long-chain particles. Um, so, we could play around with this methodology here to try and construct nanoparticles of different shapes, and maybe work towards nanowires as well. It's really just an introduction and, and a sharing of this particular experiment. If anybody wants to pick it up and run with it, great, by all means do. Uh, I think very, very interesting. So returning to our copper nanoparticles that we have here, if we decant off the top, and as I say, you can see that's got a nice coppery colour. And that's because there are already copper nanoparticles dispersed throughout that, there just isn't that many of them. And we have this copper particle sludge here. Now what I've got in here is 200 milliliters of water and 50 milliliters of isopropanol alcohol. So if I wash that out and add it to there, <coughs> and add half a gram of sodium lauryl sulfate, which is uh, a surfactant. Then we're going to try and disperse those copper nanoparticles in that liquid. The reason I've added the isopropanol alcohol, incidentally, is that it stops the foaming being too aggressive. So what we get out of it is this beautiful pink-looking foam. Now, obviously, uh, it's got isopropanol alcohol in there, so that foam will die down, and it's pretty hot. Now, what I'm presenting here, really, is a methodology. 
and it's pulled from um, graphene research because obviously they do the same kind of thing in graphene. So we have a nice pink foam and you can see it beginning to separate out already with the liquid at the bottom there. So we'll leave that to settle for a little bit and then have a look at it then. Okay, so that's had time to um, settle down and it's been sitting around for about an hour or so. And as you can see, it's a nice pink solution. So um, that's no my, by no means conclusive, of course. What we need to do is uh, leave it sitting around for weeks in order to be able to say that that is a stable um, solution. But uh, it's pretty good if you think that in an hour or so, most of the heavy stuff would actually precipitate it out. We're getting a tiny bit of precipitate at the bottom, so my guess is eventually it will all settle out. Um, so really, it's more of a jumping off point than anything, because all I did with this was give it 20 minutes in a household blender. Um, let's say you use a Silverstone on it and a homogenizer, then I'm pretty sure you'd get much better results than that. So there's an interesting way of dispersing copper nanoparticles in a solution using a blender. Anyway, I hope this whole sort of copper nanoparticle video was interesting to you because I think there's quite a lot in it uh, and quite a lot to explore from it. And I, I hope you enjoyed watching. Thank you very much.